Well, hello there, and welcome to the 152nd edition of DF Direct Weekly, which for some reason still is our weekly show where we discuss the latest gaming and technology news. And um, wow, what can I say? It's been a pretty bad week. Uh, joining me to discuss some of this, uh, first of all, uh, Alex Battaglia. Hello. Oh, hey there, Rich. Yeah, sorry. I was distracted by some old PC parts on the ground over here. Um, <laughs> yes, yes I'm excited. Well, not really excited. I'm actually pretty sad to talk about the, a couple of the topics here, but there's some other good things on the docket, thankfully, this week. Okay. And uh, he's back with his uh, dynamic wallpaper, John Linneman. Hey, Rich. Good to be here. Yeah, Mike is... Uh, sorry, not Mike. <laughs> Mark is, is bad. I'm looking at my mic and I'm thinking Mike. But actually, <laughs> if I look at the screen there, I see Mark Triforce Duddleson in the back. He's still here, okay. and this time he's playing Star Fox 64. Will he manage to complete the game during the duration of this Direct, like last I week? I hope so. Okay. He should possibly. He's a bit rusty at this one, but I await Mark's completion of I mean, Star Fox, Fear and uh, Zexish. Okay. <laughs> Fear and Zexish. <laughs> yes. I also see John is sporting some incredible... Uh, hair works beard tech this week oh it's yeah been growing. i'm just letting it grow a bit yeah, I, mean, those, I don't know if i don't know if i'll keep that or not I'm just like whatever <laughs> the tessellated hair as long as it doesn't impact the frame rate of your feed that's fine <laughs> yeah okay. it might cause a it bit rate good. spike like it. it might cause a bit rate spike with the extra detail yeah as the camera gets closer it just drops frames. some macro blocks on youtube <laughs> Okay, uh, well, let's move on to the first news topic. Um, wow, this one's really, really difficult. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously for a while now, we've been seeing a series of um, wide-scale layoffs within the games industry. And, you know, when it comes to doing DF Direct Weekly, it's something we don't often talk about because obviously you can commiserate with people that have lost their jobs, but the scale of of the um, of, of the impact just on a single individual is not something I think we can actually encapsulate within a... Uh, within a podcast as such. Um, but this week, man, um, 900 jobs lost at, at Sony, the entire closure of the uh, London studio, um, EA shedding staff, big name projects being killed. Um, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel, which we'll talk about in our next news topic. But for this one, um, it's really, really difficult to talk about. But I think the underlying thing that's happening here is that, well, suddenly it seems that the business model driving this entire industry is not seen as sustainable. Therefore, um, these cuts are being made. I do think there are much better ways in which this could have happened. I do think there are ways in which the industry could have transitioned more gracefully towards a, a new model. Um, but ultimately, it seems that the uh, the need to appease shareholders and financial analysts is taking precedent there, which is which is of extreme yes. disappointment. John, where where do you want to start with this? I mean, I don't know where to start. I mean, I would start by saying I don't think this works. We've seen time and again that layoffs like this don't actually fix the problem, and I don't think this is going to fix whatever problems they're dealing with. And uh, something else needs to change. I mean, you just take away the cr creatives. Uh, you introduce uncertainty into the studio. Now people are fearing for their jobs. You're not getting the best work out of them that way. Uh, and then you, you look at something like Insomniac. These guys are the all-stars of PlayStation. They've basically kept the PS5 alive, I might argue, with their releases in a way that no other Sony studio has been able to deliver. Agreed. And then they're being punished with layoffs as well. I think that's frankly fucking unbelievable. Pardon my French. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fine. Like I, I think it's unacceptable. All of this stuff is unacceptable, and I think it's very short-sighted. And uh, I hope that these shareholders, I hope these people get what's coming to them somehow. <laughs> I'll just say that much. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crap. I mean, it's crap shoot. Insomniac used to be an independent studio, of course, and they did put out a statement which, while not overtly critical of what has happened, they are clearly making their displeasure. Um, As they should. Yeah, plainly evident. And and exactly so, because, um, you know, as you say, John, the amount of output that these guys have put out across this generation, this kind of threadbare generation, if you like, these guys have delivered time and time again. Marvel Spider-Man at the moment, second um, game there. 
uh, 10 million copies sold. I mean, what what more can they do? I mean, that's that's just, you know, astonishing. Um, Naughty Dog oh, 2, there are layoffs there. I mean, Naughty Dog, you know, obviously they've had that issue with their multiplayer game being canned, years worth of work lost. You would expect that maybe there would be some redeployment of resources and redundancies there, but my God, Insomniac, what's going on there? And the closure of the London studio seems to, in- and and uh, job losses at Fire Sprite seems to indicate that Sony are, um, how can I say it? You know, that they're not going to support PlayStation VR 2 with first party titles in the way that we would have expected or hoped. Um, right. So it's, it's almost as if the PSVR 2 is also being um, sort of jettisoned uh, by default. Um, man, it's I not, just, like, man, it's yeah. not the Sony that I think most people loved anymore. Like they've reduced their lineup. It's so slim now compared to what it used to be. And it, which also highlights just the, the issues with modern game development at this, at this scale. Well, that's an interesting uh, point. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, Ollie Jacobs, DF supporter, uh, chimes in with this. Uh, Herman Holst's comments about, quote, unquote, delivering the immersive narrative-driven stories that PlayStation Studios is known for in the wake of these layoffs is concerning to me. I've definitely enjoyed the time I've spent with games such as Spider-Man and The Last of Us, but the loss of Japan Studios signals a greater departure from what Sony was to me, a repertoire of focused and thought-provoking games that try different things as opposed to following what I would personally consider very safe formulas designed for mass market appeal. I was taken aback recently while revisiting Astro's Playroom as it occurred to me just how little a PS6 version of the same game would be able to say about our current generation. I'm curious to hear thoughts about this. Do you think this could mm. change going forward? Um, well, Sony seems to be on a on a route forward that's, um, uh, that is bearing fruit. Helldivers 2. I mean, we've obviously got our issues with the live service side of things, but Helldivers 2 has been an incredibly successful game where the success, I think, has been warranted. But he's quite right. I mean, this is something we've talked about on the Direct for a long time now, the diversity and the experimentation and the innovation and the fun that was synonymous with with PlayStation has kind of evaporated in favour of these uh, immersive narrative driven stories which you know obviously they have their place right and they are they are mega successful but as part of a repertoire as opposed to the be all and end all I think that's that's kind of what is uh, problematic with Sony and and PlayStation at the moment Uh, Alex I haven't had had your thoughts on this but it's not great is it I think it is actually, John was uh, trying to hint at that just a second ago, that I do think it is um, endemic of the larger strive towards these larger narrative-based games, just like the the supporter just mentioned, where um, if uh, you're targeting all these large development cycles of five to seven years or something like that, um, and you're putting all these eggs in one proverbial basket, uh, when one of these games does not meet the, the criteria to... Uh, be as wildly successful as some sort of financial analyst would like uh, for growth purposes Uh, because it's not just about making your money back it's always about growing and growing and growing and growing uh, as soon as that happens then you uh, you aren't meeting these targets and you start having to reduce um, because the line needs to go up mentality and I don't think it is all at all sustainable and I really think it would make a lot of sense for Sony to I mean, they them doing it now after having committed to it for so long is probably going to be very hard. Uh, but they probably should not scale back development in the in the sense of reduce studios as they're doing right now. But they should look at entirely different project types. Um, that's how I view it, at least, uh, because I don't uh, like w- the next Naughty Dog game. I have no idea when it's going to come out. The next uh, God of War he is away. very far off. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Insomniac is the one carrying the entire PS5 on its back, like John said, in, in many respects, with them releasing four titles. They've released a lot, and uh, them being punished as a part of this just shows how kind of backwards it is, just in terms of just like logic. It just seems so wrong. And I, I really do think they need to start targeting different titles. It's the one advantage that I think um, 
yeah, Microsoft and Xbox do not have these large tentpole releases, and they've largely kind of failed at doing that. Um, well, they're, they're hoping to address that this year, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, th th that's the nice part, I guess. But they, they've also done a really good job of having like middle tier t releases and a greater diversity of portfolio there. Yeah, agreed. Strain, you know, going for those PC only games, uh, strategy, Pentiment, Hi Fi Rush you've got your first person shooters you got your third person shooters you got your live service titles it's, it's been at least pretty diverse in that respect uh and i think that's uh, a strength uh there that sony really should probably have as well too to buy the time in between their large expensive narrative third person games with lots of cutscenes. I, I think they really need different games and this is not the fault of any of the developers i would say that are just making the games doing the art doing the programming this is like like a philosophy of the entire sony studios as well as to some degree producers that want these games out there um to be the only type of game they they target yeah. i think the issue has been that um it uh, I'm, my figures might be wrong here, but from memory, um, the profit margins were like nine percent during the during the PlayStation Four year, and it seems to be slipping now. I think six percent might be might be the, uh, the the new number, which is causing alarm, which is which has started this chain reaction of uh, stuff within Sony. Um, but yes, I don't think the solution is you know automatically cut everything and lose all of that talent that you've painstakingly acquired. I mean, you know, they've literally. You know, it's not so long ago that they bought Fire Sprite, for example, and, uh, you know, cuts are being made. The London studio has got decades worth of uh, pedigree oh and, and history, and that's just gone. Um, just generally, if you look historically at the, the treatment of uh, UK developers by Sony, it's it's not a, a particularly great track record. Um, there's There have been issues, obviously, recently with Media Molecule as well. Media Molecule, I mean, when you're looking for, like, innovation, fun... Everything that PlayStation should be. I mean, these are the guys that have consistently delivered over the years. Uh, the founders are all gone now, um, as, as far as I can tell. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty bleak look. I just can't help but feel that there is a better way here to, to manage these kind of transitions. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's deep, deeply saddening. And... Um, yeah, they're they're coasting at this point in this way that's very dangerous where they really are putting all their eggs in one basket. And games these days are being asked to everything's gotta be the biggest thing. So, you know, you have your story based games, but you also need to make sure people keep playing it with these live service elements. You need to make sure the world is the biggest thing ever. You need to have the best graphics, you need to have naughty dog level polish on everything. Uh, all this stuff takes way too long to make. It's way too expensive. And if it fails, it's like, it's a catastrophe. And they've thrown out all the other small games that they used to make, all the medium scale games they used to make. And now they just have this scant few, they just have a small handful of studios making these types of games that absolutely need to succeed. And even if they do succeed, apparently that's not enough. Uh, this is not sustainable. It's not going to work long term. And mm -hmm. right now they're lucky that they have the position in the market that they do. I'm going to say it. it's luck, a lot of it. Uh, both both Sony and Microsoft have stumbled this gen in different ways. Uh, yeah. Nintendo's really, they're they're doing pretty, I mean, they have their own issues, but they're they're doing pretty all right comparatively. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely concerned about the future of everything in the industry right now. And I feel like there's just, I, I, you just need to look at, at the way success happens. They try to manufacture success and I don't think it always works. Uh, sometimes surprises if when the old PlayStation and a lot of these old other platforms, they used to create so many games at different scales. They didn't always know which ones would hit and which ones would not. Sometimes it'd just be like a small success, but find like a dedicated audience. Sometimes it would blow up out of nowhere. They've even, we've seen it this year, even with games like Helldivers 2 or Power World. Where yeah. you you don't I mean Helldivers two did take a long time to make it and I guess Power World too but still they're kind of unknowns that just kind of come out of nowhere and they light yeah. up the sales charts right and they, they and won't have the Last of Us level budgets they don't need to no. they shouldn't people want fun <laughs> games Power World was a broken piece of garbage at first like the game is fun and funny and that's that shows what matters right people had fun with it despite the fact that it was this like it was extremely janky there was heart there. 
And I think that's okay. And I think they need to get comfortable again with making these smaller games. Tap into, look what's happening in the indie space, but you get like, you know, that first party sort of prestige behind it again. That's what drove PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 and even PS3 to a degree, I'd say. And PS4 was like, they were at least getting games out at a more regular case, but this generation is like the nothing. It's the weirdest generation because there's actually objectively, there are tons of great games to play like an absolute tons. So it's actually kind of good, but at the same time, we've never seen one so devoid of creativity from the big (laughs) players. uh, At least some of them where it just feels like they're doing nothing. I like that point that Ollie Jacobs made about Astro's playroom you put the PS5 in there for a PS6 version of the game, and what do, what do you have? Like, the detachable disk drive? The need to activate it? Do you, is there a mini game where you activate the disk drive over the internet? Do you have the, do you have the PSVR 2 there sitting, sitting in a recycle bin? Uh, I mean, do you have, like... Do you, like, play a level that's comprised of, like, remakes of levels from other games? Like, what do you do? I, I don't know. It's just... I'm feeling kind of down about all this, so part of well, the rant. I love it. <laughs> Something I've got to tackle here. This is a, a point made by supporter 1040 STF. A few hours before Sony announced 900 layoffs and the closure of London studio, we saw pictures on social media of Jim Ryan oh, no. celebrating his retirement at London <laughs> studio with himself and employees smiling together. These pics were five or six years old. How cynical was that? This is another uh, issue which I think is needs to be brought to the fore, which is the concept of um, kindness. In, in mm. you know, let's say that all of these um, layoffs were unavoidable, right? Yeah, let's t- let's just take that as a concept. I don't agree with it, but there it is. Right. The concept that you know, assuming on the face of it that everything we saw on social media is true, the concept that you know. Jim Ryan would go and visit a studio, which he must surely have been fully aware of would be like facing closure uh, in in a short period of time thereafter. It's it's really unkind. It's mm. it's not the way I would consider management to be behaving. Um, I, I just can't get my head around that. That that was the thing on the uh, the day of the announcements of this. I was obviously quite um, upset at the, uh, the the sheer scale of the closures, the seemingly arbitrary nature of who was facing uh, redundancy here, and then that lands, and I was just furious for the rest of the day, angry. You know, um, maybe there's more to it than meets the eye. But certainly think, Sony uh, didn't seem to do anything to to address that. Just to clarify, I think when you read it, you said five to six years old, it sounded like. But oh, five to six days. Yes. So, yeah, like within a week. Six days, yes. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important to that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's just... Um, uh, Really made me angry. The, the Jim Ride victory tour at London Studio. Way to go, Jim. Well, you know, to, it, <laughs> yeah, that's embarrassing. You know, it's all coming apart now. Seemingly, the whole strategy that's been pursued for the part for the past few years is seemingly not proven to be um, uh, sustainable, as we've been talking about on the direct for like <laughs> what seems like years now. <laughs> but I mean. You know, what can we say? Uh, Moving on from Sony, we had um, EA shedding staff as well. Um, Looks like Respawn's first person shooter based on the Star Wars franchise has been terminated. That's not going to be happening. What a great idea, EA. That is such a bad idea. You guys are just the best. Just killing off. Like, yeah, it's not like Respawn hasn't delivered before, right? Like, no, just kill it off. Okay, whatever. Yeah, go, you know, go like make, they're go the make darlings in the first position shooter space, and they make big the, brain like, move. super wildly express. You know, they obviously get Star Wars in spite of the technical aspects of certain of those games. Like, they obviously get it. Like, the, just you read, cutting that. You read those, those freaking statements from these guys at the top, and it's just like, it's just like word nonsense. Yeah, out word sound. It doesn't. It's we're just gonna nonsense. make it. We're gonna be the best studio. We're gonna focus on our strengths like we're the best we're the best everything's gonna be but it's ridiculous at this point it's just stupid bad the funny thing is of course well not funny peculiar should we say is that um the 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 concept that um uh, respawn hasn't been able to iterate on titanfall 2 in any way in any genre in any franchise (laughs) Mm. is like one of the biggest you know missed opportunities of the industry for like 
I don't know how long. It's astonishing. That game is so beloved now, and they it has a cult following, but EA sent it to die back in yeah. the day. They released that right on top of Battlefield. They pushed Battlefield over Titanfall 2. It like like the way they've handled that franchise. Like, thank goodness they at least got um their uh what whatever it's Star called. Wars? No, the other game, Apex. Uh, like, oh, the Apex. That's right, Apex, Apex Legends. Legends. They got that. That's something. But come on, man, Titan Titanfall Two is so good, and people know it now. It was missed at the time, yes, but now that has cachet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the studio that was handling the campaign for uh, Battlefield um, has been closed. Criterion will be taking point on that. I mean, it's Criterion have experience. Um, uh, with Battlefield, have been a support studio. Did they do Hardline? No, that was somebody mm-hmm. else. That was the LA studio. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, they've been a support studio for, for for Battlefield, so I guess you know they they do have experience there. But you know, you can't help but wonder whether Criterion should be doing other things. Need for Speed didn't land as it should do, but the game was brilliant. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it just seems to be like it's all numbers driven as opposed to you know. Um, product driven i think yeah. the decisions that are being made there it's um it's it's astonishing uh, also um recently reports of uh supermassive laying off 90 employees i think there is a, a there is a sort of sort of wider issue here which is that um well for years we've had zero interest rates effectively on loans that's no longer the case so the amount of money that can be brought into the industry is is you know, the taps have turned off, so to speak. So there are reasons that we're going to be seeing this contraction going forward, but it doesn't make any of this news easier to talk about or report. And I could see it, some of those guys making a QTE sequence similar to the other supermassive games, like the Dark Pictures, Jim Ryan. Or, not that it's Sony, <laughs> but, you know, you're getting chased around in office by, like, a you know an evil jim ryan with like red eyes and and they dodge the wrong way unfortunately Mm. Uh, before we round off this 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 incredibly depressing discussion uh we got this uh question here from mad monk uh given the layoffs and realization that the current production processes aren't uh, economically viable what is being slash could be done to make those production processes more efficient e.g engines becoming easier to work with ai co-pilot streaming coding Mm. RT only games meaning less manual work on lighting, etc. Less cost means less risk, which means more creativity, which seems sorely needed in the industry. I think there's no one answer to this, right? And I do no. think, you know, obviously there is a major a- uh, sort of AI backlash. But similarly, if you consider AI as a tool um, to aid creatives as opposed to replacing them, then it becomes a different story. In, in my opinion, you know, good tools sure. are good tools, right? Um, obviously, we're seeing things that are happening in the likes of Unreal Engine 5, which are specifically designed to um, effectively democratize high-end production values and, you know, stuff like gigantic open worlds so that even indie de- uh, developers can do it. I suspect that um, this is probably one of the reasons why Unreal Engine 5 has become so popular, uh, recently, simply because they're, that's their focus, right? To, to, to effectively cut costs, if you like. Um, I don't know, uh, Alex, any thoughts on this? I mean, I could see, like, regarding the RT thing, it doesn't, it won't save anyone's job. Um, but in reducing the scope of a game, I do think there's probably something to be said about, like, how much iteration time exists because you have to, like, bake out lighting in a level uh but that is only tempered like if you spent if you're saving more time by not having to bake out lighting in a level or something like that and having less iteration time as a result of that uh that has to be tempered by the fact that the, the producers and the developers should try and then use that time or to reduce scope or to use it wisely to f- fulfill other tasks in the same amount of time that would have been done there and not use it as an excuse to balloon out again to a larger size, right? Uh, which I think is not at all guaranteed. And that's another thing that I don't think AI usage necessarily guarantees. Like if you just get fixated on the usage of one tool and uh, you, you kind of want to make it as a part of like a key- cornerstone experience 
of the game uh you can end up spending so much time iterating and try and get that so perfect that you end up just like losing sight of actually shipping a game in a good amount of time uh so i don't know uh i i don't think there's a technical solution necessarily to what's happening it's like a philosophical one right uh, i think it's basically um uh, yeah i mean there's going to be a whole range of things that you can use to increase productivity right but i think the major challenge here is essentially the nature of the kind of games that are being made and the fact that everything requires five years to develop and a hundred million dollar budgets minimum um that's right. that's not sustainable right and that's where things can change i mean the the role of the of the shorter game i think has never been more important now from a financial aspect but also from you know what the kind of player wants perspective do, do you know not every game has to have like 50 hours of play uh, attached to it and you know not every game needs to to have that you know in intense level of money invested in it and it can still be fun we've seen that borne out with the likes of um hell divers 2 and power world um yeah so i think there's going to be a sort of reevaluation of what games are over the next few years the issue is mm. is that it, there's going to be short term implications for all of this which is that um you know we could see uh, games that are even sort of close to completion actually be cancelled um and then over the, you know once the ramifications of this fully set in you know the the obvious conclusion will be we'll be seeing fewer games in the years to come because they do take years to develop um yeah so well i guess it's we just have to wait and see what happens there but Man, this has been really, really depressing. It's, it's, it's time to leverage the new the uh, the new wave of gamers coming up right now. The Roblox players, their standards <laughs> for graphics are so yeah. low that we may as well start back from zero again and just like build up. <laughs> They'll come at that and be like, "Dang, this looks amazing!" But it's like you know, PS2 era visuals. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, Dude, I, I've nothing seen wrong it. with the PS2 era, John. God, no, what I'm, what I'm saying awesome. is, is that the PS2 era is like a, pr a pretty good spot in terms of like the visuals can look pretty darn attractive and the games run really smooth and they feel great to play. And it's like, you know what? I'm happy with that. I'd be happy with games that look like that more often, you know. Yeah, I would be too. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, what happened to Geometry Wars, right? Yeah, right. It's a classic example of a game. Oh, that sorry, didn't... Rich. When, when, they, when Bizarre Creations went out of business, it went away. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I know, is, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing game, it back to layoffs. That game was like one of the greatest things I have ever played. Geometry Wars 2 specifically was incredible. Dude, I know. Incredible. Didn't require $100 million of investment as far as I'm aware. People loved it. I still think about it. I still want to play it quite often. I mean, incredible game. I mean, it's time to think a bit more, you know, holistically widely about what people actually want to spend time doing. I think maybe that's one of the reasons why Switch does pretty well, because you do tend to get a, a broader diversity, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Nintendo itself brings the diversity as well with their games. There's a lot on there. I mean, and some of it, you know, it's hit or miss, not for everybody, but they sure are delivering. Yeah. They sure are delivering a lot of Wii U games. <laughs> well, they they did do that, but you know, no, I get nobody bought saying. the Wii U. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. Um, okay, do we have anything more to add to this? Can we, can we move on to something a bit more, well, bit less depressing? Let's move on to better. Okay. Uh, second news story of the week. It's actually, well, three different stories, I think. And it is in the wake of this disastrous news that we've just been discussing, which is that um, there are, there are signs that developers a kind of adjusting to this new reality and effectively taking control of their own destinies. And um, I guess, well, a kind of tangent, tangent, tangential to that is mm -hmm. uh, the idea of Sabre Interactive. Uh, they've been sold off from uh, the Embracer Group. It looks like there's a $500 million deal, um, $500 million deal for them to uh, exit um, uh, the embrace of death, as it's been called, uh, which is good, but kind of more um, positively, and is the concept that um, Toys for Bob, who are kind of swallowed up by um, Activision, weren't they repurposed into a Call of Duty support studio at some point? Um, yeah. Either way, 
Yeah, they've yeah. gone independent, and it looks as though they're trying to set up some sort of deal with Microsoft. But effectively, this is a um, independent studio that wants to take control of its own destiny again and do the things that it's lo- that it loves. And similarly, we've seen that this week Remedy bought back the rights to uh, Control 2, and I think another project, Condor, Project Condor, from 505 mm-hmm. Games. And they're free to partner with who they want to partner um, with that franchise or those games going forward, which I think is great. Um, John, thoughts on this? Oh, this is actually great news, all of this stuff. I'm really happy to see it. I mean, obviously there are challenges when going independent once again, but I think this yeah. is uh, this is a good thing for the industry. Uh I don't think Saber Interactive is going to have any trouble finding work at this point. They they do awesome work, I would yep. say. They have a lot of clients, uh, and they have escaped the embrace, which uh, hopefully mm-hmm. other studios can escape the embrace as well before it's too late. <laughs> we'll see. Well, there's uh, talk that they're on the cusp of selling Gearbox. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that was a big one for them, and I'm sure that would bring Embracer plenty of money to sell it, and Gearbox mm. could live on, which it should. Uh, Toys for Bob, of course, you know, I'd assume by working with Microsoft, they're talking about working on IP that Microsoft now owns, yeah. that Activision previously owned, which makes a lot of sense. And as you suggested, they are effectively escaping from the COD mines, which was my <laughs> big concern for them. COD mines. I mean, that was kind of the, that was kind of the issue with Activision, right? It's like they would just swallow up even successful studios and just... Like you, you work on COD now, go make skins kind of, that's the vibe you got from a lot of this. And that, that was unfortunate. Yes. Uh, and they, they, they seem to be free. And then the 505 situation, I mean, that's not good for 505, obviously, but I'm happy that Remedy has those control. They have control of control back. Control too. Mm-hmm. Well, that brings us on to a question from Darja Ko, who asks, with news that Remedy have found a remedy for their loss of control over Control, <laughs> how do the team think that Control 2 will be remedied by <laughs> by all this newfound Control? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think Control is a very successful game, and it was a very interesting one because I think it um, after Quantum Break, where they uh, spent a lot of time and uh, money uh on the game and a lot of years of work that control was supposed to be a smaller title right yes and it was supposed to be like uh be kind of efficient like you can see aspects of it that are totally lifted from quantum break and that's a good thing because quantum break had more or less solid shooting mechanics um and things like that and it lifts like things like character models uh from it uh and you know some environmental art probably too and it's it's like it was like a good way to like get a new game concept out there and uh have it be cheaper and then try and build success on the fact that it was cheap and still have good quality and i think that would is what i would love to see of them taking control of control 2 again here would be them saying it's not going to be a bigger and better sequel like i don't know die are to die harder or or whatever it's called you know it's it, it could just be like another it could just be yeah, uh it could just be another uh it could just be another game like that with just like some slight tweaks uh and just like another great story uh and then you know like with the usual remedy flair i, I would like for them to keep the game size the same and then shop it around in that way i don't know if they'd self-publish it i don't know if they want to do that um, they've got a lot of but, opportunities with well, yeah. with what they've done with Northlight in Alan Wake 2. Because, you know, when in your interview with them, you know, when they talked about how they had to enhance Northlight for Alan Wake 2, it's like, well, we've, we've got to go outdoors. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, which you know, presented a massive technical challenge. But that technical challenge has now been overcome, which means that Control 2 has more opportunities. Um, it does. Yeah, I mean... In terms of what I'd like to see from Remedy, um, I would like to see them grow out their quote unquote, it's not a cinematic universe, but it is their gaming universe, you know, connected properties. And, you know, let's have the Remedy Avengers at some point, you know. Yeah, it makes actually a lot of sense. All of those characters coming together in one game, build it up across the years. Can take years, decades, if needs be. But if the end end point is you know this mega conclusion to a specific storyline that brings all of these games together, I think that would be mega. It's never been done before in games, as far as I can remember. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that would be that would be pretty awesome. 
Um, John, any ideas? Well, I think Control was uh, the best new thing that Remedy has made. At the, at the time of its release, it was the best thing I think they'd ever made. I think Control actually might be the best Remedy game from a pure game design and gameplay standpoint. Right. It's really smartly designed. It controls like a dream, and there's so many unique ideas in there, and it just feels like Remedy the game, if you will, right? Uh, Alan Wake 2, I love Alan Wake 2, but I think the actual gameplay, the moment to moment gameplay experience is less good than Control, as it is more focused on telling a story and atmosphere, and there is room for that as well. So I'm extremely eager to see what they do now with Control 2, given that they've had a lot of critical success lately. Um, and they've kind of become a critical darling more so than before. I think people yeah. always loved and respected. Uh, remedy games but there was this feeling around like alan wake was people liked it but it, it was known for kind of being a very repetitive game uh quantum break i loved quantum break but a lot of people did not uh and then they sort of reclaimed their name in a big way and have become really kind of almost almost like the game equivalent of an art house studio you know where mm -hmm. it's um they are it's it's certainly they're in the triple a space i would say but they feel connected somehow in a different way to the people if you will they're connected to the people well an interesting story is that um i remember i was talking to uh, remedy one time about um we were wanting to add control to our benchmarking suite and i asked him if there's any specific area of the game repeatable part of the game maybe a cutscene that we could use for a benchmark it's like well cutscenes we didn't really concentrate on those because they cost a lot of money and if you sort of step <laughs> back and holistically look at what control is it's a masterpiece in resource allocation in that, yes. you know, what they did with that game on the budget that they had was simply incredible, simply incredible. Nobody looks at control and thinks this isn't like a AAA experience because it obviously is. But the constraints that were put in place when they actually created that game were, you know, quite significant. Obviously, there were some strategic deals that, you know, would, would have brought in revenue, you know, the stuff like the... Um, NVIDIA stuff, for example, you know. Right. But that paid off for players big time because you've got one of the best rate facing showcases still uh, of all time. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an interesting example of how the games industry could evolve and, and how it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, need to be driven by the immersive narrative driven stories that PlayStation Studios is known for. Um, just a thought. Yeah. I love the Remedy uh, model uh, in that presented in that game. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, obviously, they've yeah. had uh, their recent financial statement as well, where they uh, announced that, um, what was it, 1.3 million copies of Alan Wake 2 sold so far, but the development costs still haven't been covered, which is a, s a slight note for concern, but they didn't seem unduly perturbed by that. I guess they would see a longer tail for a Remedy-style game across the years. I think Control's done something like 10 million at this point. Yeah, it's it's like it being released on the the amount of platforms it did, and then also having its long tail because then it went from EGS to Steam yeah. at one point, and that was another basically rebirth of the game. Yeah. I definitely remember when covering that game, a lot of people were like, "Oh, it's on EGS. I'll wait." Um, and of course, and the, the PS Five and Xbox Series versions as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. It kind of makes sense. So you know, mm. there is some hope for optimism going forward. Um, based on these moves that we've seen. I think Remedy paid something like, was it 17 million euros to regain rights to those games? Uh, not an insignificant mm -hmm. amount of money, but, you know, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> and they also have so much in the pipeline. We don't really know what this... Was it... Did you call it Operation Condor? What did you call it? Uh, well, Condor? It, I I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but that that is a game that they are developing. Yeah. They've got that, whatever that is. And they've apparently got Max Payne 1 and 2 remakes. Yes. And then mm -hmm. Control 2. And then maybe Alan Wake 3 is somewhere in the future there. It seems like there's a lot. It's a, a lot bit of a shame they can't buy the Max Payne rights back. Right. Oh, my gosh. Death yeah. Rally 2. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> what? <laughs> we could uh, add in the rally cars into the uh, Remedy gaming universe. <laughs> I think they should. They be they belong there. There could be a, a driving section in the uh, Remedy Avengers game when it comes to pass. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, look, no more to add to that. Let's move on to the next news topic.
Before we move on to the next topic, though, one weird thing happened yesterday that I was kind of surprised by. We were downtown, went to a local, I think it was the Saturn here in Germany, which is like a big sort of uh, media, entertainment, electronic shop. I saw a copy of Sifu uh, for a pretty mm. good price. And I've, I've never played this. I, I had wanted to play it for a while. So I said, oh, you know, I'll grab that. Go up to the cashier, pay for it, start to walk away. And then he's like, oh, hold on, you know, on Shudugong. And I was like, okay, come back. Did I forget something? And he's like, do you have PS Plus? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, well, you know, that game is on this next month's list of PS Plus games. If you want, I can just, uh, you know, refund, oh. refund your purchase and you can just get it there. And I just kind of was like, uh, no, I'm, I'm good. And then walked away. And I thought, I thought about this for a second. Like there, there's a him? store employee here that's actively saying, please don't buy this product at our store. You can go get it. You can go not own it. You can go rent it on this uh, other service online. If you, if you prefer, I mean, on one hand, there is something to be said for that kind of like honesty i guess like this guy's like mm -hmm. hey i can save you some money yeah so that's respectable but i found it really odd that that a store employee would actively say oh let me just actually refund you real quick I and mean, you just go get it on do PS you feel Plus. that he's hastening the decline of physical media he is he is the cornerstone of all of it okay. this one man here in in frankfurt can we, he's uh, the rig leader of a cabal yeah, of a cabal of anti-disc <laughs> the anti-disc mafia the, the bullshit mafia <laughs> yeah. can we uh quickly check in while we are taking this break from discussion can we quickly uh check in on mark uh yeah where's he at what's, what's mark triforce duddleson doing in the back there uh just be the easy path Oh, he just completed the easy path of Star Fox 64. Okay. And we'll be moving the on. easy path? Really? Yeah. Already? Yeah, he, he finished it. I forgot. Okay. And so quick. We're still talking about Star Fox 64 today. It's a great game, and it's also very short. You know, food for thought. <laughs> yeah. Really. Okay. Should we move on? Yes. Let's do it. Okay, so last week a trailer, uh, quote unquote, dropped... And uh, it was pretty phenomenal. Kingmakers. Now, we actually got to see that trailer, I think, a good couple of weeks before it went live. And um, we've done some right. stuff with uh, the developers, which will be coming soon. But this trailer, I think it's currently just over 600,000 views. And quite rightly so. It's just came out of nowhere. It's a game that's driven by a concept which I haven't seen before, um, which, which is oh, quite oh, remarkable. Man. I mean, I, <laughs> I guess... Let's just talk about what it was like to watch this trailer for the first time. Now, you know, we got an email out of the blue saying, check this out. You know, we'd quite like you to to take a look at it. And initially it looks like an RTS game, right? And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, this looks interesting. Maybe it's one for Alex. Then at the 23 <laughs> second point, <laughs> all hell breaks loose. John, would you like to take up the story? Sure, yeah. So at that point then... Uh, you get a quick glimpse of a post-apocalyptic modern city with a guy driving a pickup truck who then <laughs> seemingly warps back to, uh, you know... The medieval era? The medieval era in the middle of a large battle that is ensuing. And then he proceeds to unleash uh, modern weaponry upon these hordes of individuals that are engaging in warfare across the, <laughs> the battlefield here. <laughs> and it's chaotic. And... So that's the thing, right? Is when we got the mail, it was, um, it was, this, this is developed by the team that made Road Redemption. And I recently covered, uh, Road Redemption, uh, within the Digital Foundry retro video on the Road Rash series. Yeah. And, um, Ian from, uh, Tiny Build Games, uh, I shared that video with him after he, he messaged me about Road Redemption when he saw he was doing it. And I shared that video and I was, really happy like he really enjoyed it and he really felt like i did justice to uh the road rash series which was near and dear to his heart so i was very happy about that and so he's like but check this out this is this new game that we got going on and you you know expect road rash and yeah like you said it just flips everything on its head with this whole thing of like uh it looks like an rts but then it's this but it is actually an RTS, but it's also not. Mm -hmm. This is the return of the Straction genre. This was uh, Battlezone 98, uh, Uprising from Studio 3DO. Even to a degree, although it does seem to be quite different, something like Brutal Legend. Where or, yeah, you're, or 
Kamatakaga renegade a little bit. Almost sure, too. you're, you're basically you're it, storming yeah. these battlefields as like a guy, but <laughs> you can zoom the camera out and actually engage in RTS like functions such as building structures. Of course, that means everything is dynamic. There's a lot of destruction in this uh, fully real time lighting system to enable that. Trees break, things tumble down, all this kind of stuff. I spoke with them about this and. Like you mentioned, Rich, we are working on a deeper video to showcase more of this, and they actually were very eager to share their technology. They are using Unreal Engine 5, uh, but they're doing some really interesting and unique things with a crowd system that I'm not sure we've ever seen before. And that we'll we'll have they'll share all that information in that upcoming video, but it's super cool. But the idea here is that they wanted to make a game that has the quality, the mechanics, the shooting mechanics of a dedicated story-driven game where it really feels solid. When you shoot a guy, the hit reactions, the physics, everything about it feels super refined, but yet it can take place at this gigantic scale with thousands of individually animated and physically driven characters moving across the battlefield. Characters that can navigate tight spaces, go into castle courtyards and into buildings right and you're still fighting with them and just unleashing this hell the warfare the helicopters trucks bazookas sniper rifles <laughs> on this crowd yeah i was, I was particularly it's, amused to see uh an attack chopper strafing yeah. in a medieval <laughs> battlefield well i think this is kind of fulfilling like boyhood fantasies yes with people like where you would be like you know playing your knights and whatever game and then someone's like but but I got a G.I. Joe with a bazooka over here. Right. <laughs> you know? It, I, I think this is fulfilling a very interesting fantasy of mine. There's been other games that do this. Like, do you guys remember Darkest of Days? I do remember Darkest of Days. <laughs> that was a dark day when I played that game. That was game. not a good game. But, <laughs> that was not a good game. But the concept is there to, like, mishmash historical settings and use modern weaponry against you know, historical baddies. So there's a lot of fun to be had there, I actually think, in this game. I'm excited about it too. I also want to see a little bit more of the the interesting micromanagement aspects, I like uh, how that fares out too, because, you know, I, I like the idea of shooting a bunch of, like, cavalry on horses all day, but also I want to see, like, okay, well, how do you prevent them from even getting across this moat or whatever? Right, and it seems like it's also co-op. Which is yeah, really cool. I mean, holy crap, that's going to be awesome, right? I mean, yeah. that's kind of like the icing on the cake almost. Uh, just quickly, yeah, John, right. I was just looking at the Steam page. The developer is Redemption Road. That's how Ian works for they, Redemption. Tiny Build is the publisher. Oh, right, right. Yeah, Redemption yeah, yeah. Road. Yeah, they, they were changing their name around, I believe, as of okay. recently, based on uh, Road Redemption. But... Um, that's funny. Another thing that, that I believe they mentioned to me was uh, frame rate target. Currently, they're aiming for 60 FPS <laughs> on all the consoles <laughs> with this. And I'm just okay. like, okay. Like, all right, guys. Like, Good luck so with that. Uh, Good luck with that is what the way I felt about that. But I, <laughs> I will say this, though. Again, in the upcoming video, they explain why they can do that. And they give the reason and the insight into how they're achieving this. And uh, so, yes, look out for that coming fairly soon. There is a lot of insight from these guys. I talked to them for like an hour and like the passion I could see from them was just awesome. Like these are dudes that just like they wanted to make something super cool and they sure did. Uh, yeah. So I am very eager to get my hands on this, I have to say. And I love this kind of surprise. It's a small studio, small team, and they just come out with something that looks so insane and just kind of unique like a twist on things that we've not really seen before. And yep. yeah, and it just captures people's imaginations. Release date 2024, according to the Steam page, which is great news. That is That's great. Good. Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing your content about that, John. And yeah, likewise. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just can't wait to see more well, in this game. We'll have more, fo well, there's footage that'll be in that video that is not yet out. So we got more footage and all kinds of cool stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So look out for it. Okay, excellent stuff. Uh, let's move on to the next news story. It's been a sort of established convention now that emulation is entirely legal. And uh, this week, it was therefore surprising to see that Nintendo has begun legal proceedings against the creators of the Yuzu emulator. 
Um, they're seeking damages and a complete shutdown of the emulator, which in turn, I guess, would uh, set in place a legal precedent for all of these sort of emulators to be placed into what you might call legally questionable status. Um, there, it seems that <laughs> um, the uh, the basis of this complaint comes down to um, the widespread piracy of uh, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom that actually happened prior to its release. And they've kind of mapped that with the increase in Patreon support for the Yuzu emulator. And they've basically made a, what you might call a circumstantial uh, connection between um, the success of that emulator's uh, support on Patreon and the release of this pirate um, version of Tears of the Kingdom. Now, in theory, this you know the precedent has been established. Emulation is completely legal. In practice, I'm wondering whether Nintendo's kind of like skirting around what has been established and trying to come up with a new line of attack. I don't know what you think about this, John. Yeah, regretfully, I think they are doing just that, and I think it's a. Uh... This is this is a bad precedent to set, and it is concerning for all of all emulation fans. I, the traditional method of attack you would expect it feels like they have no ground to stand on, but uh, one should not underestimate Nintendo's legal team. I suppose we could say, and what they're going after. Although I did see there was something that someone highlighted where Nintendo specifically mentioned that someone adjacent to Yuzu or the Yuzu account itself tweeted about a game being playable before it was officially released right. and, but that ended up not actually being true and that the tweet came after it was released and so if that kind of mistake wow. is in there that that feels extra shady to me somehow mm. where they're they're trying to find their way to like damage these guys and i can understand why they'd be upset obviously but this is this is such a dangerous line to cross and I hope they do not succeed in these efforts. Right. Do you think they're, yeah, to, to sort of take on the devil's advocate position, you can say that Nintendo may have grounds for concerns because I think it's pretty clear that people were playing Tears of the Kingdom on Yuzu before I, the game actually came out, right? Yeah, and I think I think potentially maybe the method of attack they'll use here relates to the fact that Yuzu is sort of a Patreon based. Uh, right. So there's profit service. involved there from the, the exploitation of a Nintendo property. Correct. Uh, and even that, indirectly. Exactly. So even, but I don't know whether they can, they're not distributing these games, right? So I'm curious how they approach this, but I suspect that's that's ultimately their issue there is these guys are making I mean, their bigger issue is the piracy, but these guys are making money on this on the uh excitement around Nintendo games. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 potentially it. I think maybe there's also a more longer term gain here, which is that well, the Switch generation is now effectively over, really. We're on the last year, some might say, of a, you know, a full-blooded release schedule. If a new precedent can be put into place um, for the next generation, then, you know, obviously that would be happy days for Nintendo, but, but, but terrible for just the whole concept of emulation in general. Uh, I feel, right. man, I feel like at this point, though, with the Switch's age and everything, I would imagine they've put significantly more effort into uh, the security around the the next switch or the right. next hardware right. after what happened here um and i feel like i don't know it just it just write it out nintendo i i you probably you'd, won't affect you'd hope anything that but, switch 2 yeah. would have better security right but at the same One time um you know the revised models of the switch were also exploited uh, even when they were fully aware of the of the issues that original. the original Tegra had, yeah. you know there were still ways and means around it. Now perhaps those ways and means were found because they had that original access. But um, yeah, I mean you would oh, expect a, a slightly more robust uh, response to security issues for the successor console, right? Yeah, and it's this is all, the, all these issues are so tricky because I don't support piracy and I don't think people should be basically downloading this game for free and playing it that way i think that sucks mm. but at the same time i don't think emulation itself needs to be attacked in this way 
and fundamentally talking about security it's also in everyone's best interest that the next switch can get hacked because we oh, basically yeah. rely on this for for preservations that the company well that have. has been proven out with all of the e-shops that have been very you know shut down right. over the years and and the content that has been preserved thanks right. to exploits of the consoles exactly so if those had remained bulletproof we'd have lost an entire like chunk of games at least public access to it because mm. there is yeah, still is a- yeah go ahead alex yeah, I was just saying, like, the, the whole point about preservation in games isn't about, like, locking them away in a, in a vault. El Gore lockbox, you know, <laughs> lock box. away from everyone else where we just do this. <laughs> Can you explain but it's, that it's like, it's an old, it's an, it's an old code, Rich, but it checks out. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is, it is, uh, to say the least, this this is like when you say about preserving games, it's about preserving access to games. Um, just like no one would ever argue preserving a book is about like unless it's like a historical rare book example with like illuminated pages that needs to be in a museum they when they say about preserving books it's about making them readable and accessible it's the same thing with games and nintendo doesn't do that a good job they're not good stewards of their own catalog and they're also not good stewards of the catalog of games that they didn't produce but were made available on their previous consoles you know what i mean like general snes games uh, nintendo games and stuff like that uh so i think it it falls to the community and it falls to uh people who spend a lot of time and yes i think they should be recompensed for that time it shouldn't be a free thing i think making an emulator you should be able to be paid for that i think that's completely reasonable um i I do don't i don't like piracy for a game that hasn't released yet but i don't see any problem with buying a game for buying a Switch game for yourself and loading it up on your PC. I just really don't see a problem with that. I like that idea. It's Mm. great. Yeah. (sighs) Uh, Any more to add to this one? I mean, I guess everybody is going to be following the legal proceedings with uh, with much interest on this one because the implications uh, and the precedents that may be established. I mean, we've already seen, you know, a full frontal assault on modding which is just like, you know, incomprehensible to me, but but there it is. And this isn't great news either. Um, but I guess we just need to keep an eye on it and see what's happening there. Um, and maybe, you know, there will be some changes made uh, in terms of the people creating these emulators in terms of stuff like Patreons and whatnot. There's been a lot of um, preemptive or, or, or reactive legal action taken against people doing stuff with a kind of Patreon element to it, because it turns it into a commercial enterprise at that point. Um, But we shall see, right? Um, Let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Something of a minor drama this week, as Pentiment released on PlayStation uh, consoles, and on PlayStation 5, people discovered that it actually had uh, support for 120 frames per second, uh, which isn't available on Xbox consoles. Um, which you know caused some minor mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, issues on social media. Um, now the the thing is, of course, that Pentiment isn't a game that's going to you know overtly benefit from having support for 120 frames per second. You can see the the footage playing out here. It's not like you know a Twitch based shooter or anything like that. But at the same time, the idea that um, what was an Xbox exclusive comes to PlayStation with a new feature, um, it kind of follows in. A range follows in the tradition of gaffes that have appeared, um, seemingly, where this sort of stuff has happened. I mean, I guess the other one was uh, Ghostwire Tokyo appearing on um, uh, on Xbox after a year of PlayStation right. exclusivity and running worse on the Xbox than it did on the PlayStation. Not to a you know crazy degree, but the point is that Xbox players should expect the first party output to at least be equivalent to what's happening on the other consoles. Right? I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, Always. The developer came forth to say that it was a bug and that 120 hertz support is coming. Uh, the funny thing is, of course, is that based on Tom's footage here, um, it, it's not a locked 120, which was the big surprise for me. Um, uh, <laughs> John, is there any consequence to this or is it simply, you know, there has to be some tweaks made to tech QA and and bad optics like this need to be a thing of the past if Microsoft is to move into this multi-platform future. I, in British parlance, would you describe this as a tempest in a teapot? A storm, in a, storm <laughs> in a teacup. 
Storm in a teacup. Okay, mm. that's the parlance. Thank you for this educational moment. Um, <laughs> I I think it's it's clear that it that this was intended to be part of. Obviously, during development, they must have reached this conclusion that oh, we can actually run this at a higher frame rate, right? And they implemented that into the PS5 version straight away. And clearly wanted to implement this on Xbox as well. So yes, it has been available for years on Xbox, but this is a new feature. It's very strange that it didn't work correctly or was bugged out and didn't seem to engage, however, uh, given how... I mean, X, that part is weird. And the optics on that, I agree, are kind of bad because it does, like, given everything that's been happening lately in the Xbox scene, it does feel a little bit like them, dare, dare I say, disrespecting Xbox users, dude? Like, maybe that's the perception. <laughs> that's that the perception, like- I think. I think it's basically a, just a, um oversight. There's a series of oversights yeah. that are happening, which really shouldn't be happening when this kind of scrutiny is being attached to to these developments. Yes, that's the better way to put that's it. That's a good point to put. Yeah. They they needed to make sure that this didn't happen for optics and everything and somehow that got missed, but we this type of bug does crop up more often than you would expect, I think these days we're always surprised to see it uh, when it does happen. Uh, that's why, oh, yeah. you know, that's the kind of stuff that we catch instantly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and it, it is kind of odd, though, that it doesn't even run at a stable 120 <laughs> second, given the visual target. And what's funny is I've been playing a lot of 120 FPS console games lately and have been consistently impressed with how smooth and nice they feel. And I think all of them largely look visually more impressive than Pentiment. Not speaking artistically, because Pentiment is actually beautiful. It's yeah. visual design. But technically, I'm a little puzzled by those results. And I think this might end up working out in the Xbox favor, because I would imagine it ends up running actually slightly better on Xbox once it releases, maybe closer to the 120 pray, line. Pray for the Xbox. Pray, pray for Mojo. Pray, <laughs> okay. for Mojo. pray for them, because if, if we have another... Um, they need they need a uh, Ghostwire Tokyo or my gosh like if Dude, I, I, I'm still baffled by Ghostwire like, Tokyo it's not even that it runs Ula. worse it's like it also has like worse quality RT. way worse like, RT it's, it's like, what on earth is going like, on look, here realistically they should be identical or like comparable right but the idea that a first party release is significantly worse on that platform <laughs> that just doesn't fly man I yeah <laughs> That's I think weird. just send some engineers in from especially when California. it's like it came out a year later too on the Xbox like they had time to refine it and, and it actually got worse. I still don't get that one, but I, I think this situation will be rectified for Pentiment. Sure, but I do think there does need to be a bit more scrutiny going through these processes, and um, yeah, it, it all comes down to this concept of tech QA, which we're not even sure the extent to which it actually exists outside of the development studios. I mean, um, we've had some examples shown to us in the past of, you know, sort of validation beyond, you know, giving a game over to a QA department. Um, you know, stuff like automated fly-throughs on levels. You saw the stuff with Forza, right? They're sort of stress test for performance. Yeah. I mean, that's that's quite impressive. Moon this, Studios um, did stuff like that too for the Ori games. Right. right. They, like, spots. they had right. this like thing that would fly around the, the Ori character all over the map, like super rapidly and like push the engine as hard as possible. Then be able to graph out exactly where the game was dipping and all that kind of stuff to really yeah. understand like, okay, what's heavy, what's not. But there seems to be like um, missing a sort of sanity check. Subjective of analysis. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think it is best described as tech QA, where, you know, you bring in a game like Pentiment, it's like, well, whoa, hold on a minute. You, you know, the 60 FPS on Xbox is 120 on PlayStation 5. What's going on here? It probably shouldn't ship until this is fixed. Because, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there's that element to it. I mean, we've in our sort of work, we've encountered countless examples of uh, silly things that should have been fixed but can be, you know, it's like, why, you know, why didn't they see it? Yeah, it's it's always like that. You said the sanity check, like the sit someone down in front of the PC or whatever and just like hit a button and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> it's like, this isn't right. And I always think the shader compilation stutter is the best one. 
Like, well, it's another like the one most, that's It's up. the most extreme example. We're working. Right? Well, we are working. You are primarily working on an Alan Wake Two video, and I said to, I right. said to you yeah. yesterday, yeah. "Why doesn't it launch in full screen mode on my PC? It, it just sort of launches minimized for, for, for some reason. It's like surely somebody noticed that, and lo and behold, the patch version that you're looking at does actually Fix launch it. in a full screen <laughs> manner. Yeah, months uh, afterwards. Yeah, that's- yeah, I ma- imagine like you launch a game and you don't know much about computers and you just don't think it ever launches yeah. because it's launching minimal. Well, well, what was happening um, for me is because the epic loader is so uh, s- uh, slow to load a game, I'd be like double oh tapping God. again. Oh no! And uh, it would error out saying it's already running. It's like, oh, okay. There's that tiny icon in the taskbar there saying that he's actually running. <laughs> Jim, you can't pull an Unreal that. One. Back in the day, you could go to the Unreal Map and or the Unreal Map directory and associate the maps with the Unreal.exe. And if you double click one, it opens up Unreal in that map. But if you didn't I select know. all and hit, happen to hit Enter, <laughs> it would launch like thirty instances of Unreal. <laughs> And it yeah, works. the inability to launch a game more than one instance of a game is actually a little bit troublesome. I find. Yeah, let uh, us launch it. I'm always surprised that that happens. Like you can't run a game more than once, right? I like, can't think of any modern games that allow you to do it. Actually. I mean, it's not really that much purpose to it, but come on, come on now. Yeah, I mean, just most EXEs you can run more than one. Yeah. like on Windows, that's the point of Windows, right? The Windows that is the point. Uh, <laughs> the Windows. <laughs> that's what it was about. Yeah, man. Anyway, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the last thing to add there is just in addition to frame pacing, just all these little things like video playback or like an intro sequence that's choppy. You know, when you boot up a f- game for the first time, the first thing you see is a video that's poor quality and skipping or not playing back correctly. I don't care that it's just a logo video. I don't, or that it's the intro movie. That matters, dude. It's like, got to work. Yeah, it needs to look good. That's the first contact you have with the game, and I feel like this is. I feel like I'm going crazy when I see how games release these days. I understand they're big and complex, but like they got to work. Like and it's the especially stuff. right away, and it's often the simple yeah. stuff. Well, there were the black levels in the Halo video. Halo dude, Infinite it took video, like a year to fix. It's like you know. <laughs> Where are your eyes? Yeah. It's obvious. And then, uh, most recently, uh, the Skull and Bones intro video, Alex. <laughs> Being which is, which was like, it's, you know. It's supposed to be a 60 FPS video, too. That was the thing that shocked <laughs> me. I was like, this is supposed to be a 60 FPS video. It's actually, but like every other frame is not there. Um, I actually do always think about, um, uh, what's it called? The Callisto Protocol, where that game, the the intro video that plays behind the menu is improperly frame paced. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, that's wrong. That's yeah. Also, You're like uh, now, in that Alex. game too. The, the, yeah, the, the, they they when they for a long time they didn't actually have a dedicated pre compilation screen, and it would just pre compile in the menu, and the menu would run at like two fps <laughs> as you're trying to start the game. It's like this is not a good first experience. Like this is there's no way this is what they planned. This was obviously the biggest band aid that they could apply. But uh, yeah. in fairness, the Callisto protocol did come in hot. Um, I'm so not hot. sure you could apply that to Pentiment. Um, it, yeah, no. Or Pentiment Ghostwire Tokyo. Yeah. Right. Uh, final news story of the week. Interesting uh, thing that's emerged from Microsoft. There's going to be a GDC talk about it, but um, Direct SR, Direct Super Resolution, seems to be what we've been asking for for a long time, Alex, which is kind of like codifying Super Resolution into an API um, within um, uh, DirectX. Uh, which should, in theory, hopefully bring about much wider support for a wide range of upscalers, unless I've got that wrong. That sounds exactly like what it is based on the description. Initial reporting was like because of historical precedent saying Microsoft's going to bring about its own upscaler into the upscaling. Yeah, didn't didn't we see some leaks in an upcoming Windows build? Which seemed to- yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, so the the leaks in the upcoming Windows build, the fact that they weren't very, uh, it wasn't descriptive enough exactly about it was, and I th- I think that's reasonable that people thought that. Uh, uh, but it makes a lot more sense when it is what it is described as in the preview text for the GDC presentation on the Microsoft blog, uh, the DirectX blog specifically describing it as system level control essentially it sounds yeah. like for the user to implement what version of super resolution they want based upon i guess their gpu uh, or their driver mm-hmm. um and this makes a lot of sense for one 
technically nvidia created streamline which is what this is kind of about from the developer facing perspective where all these inputs streamline says okay you plug in your dll and uh for whatever upscaler it is and then it's gonna make it so that you don't as a developer you don't have to necessarily implement fsr2 by its lonesome or xcss by its lonesome rather a generic framework that then works with a bunch of upscalers Mm -hmm. And then you just have to expose it in the UI of your game. Uh, that uh, is a great idea. The problem was immediately uh, AMD didn't want to support it. And uh, I think, Intel I think did, there though. was also trouble. What? I think Intel did want to support it from memory. So. Intel did want to support mm. it. And we did see actually streamlined releases. Okay. You, you can go to the files and see that um, of a game. You'll see .sl, I think. Uh, often in the files and a lot of games that had XCSS and DLSS did use Streamline. I'm pretty sure it's actually used in the Nixies games, okay. uh, for example. So it did see some usage and it, I think it was a great idea, but I think Microsoft taking control of this is better in general just because if it becomes part of Windows, uh, then I hope it sees a lot more support. Um, and if a developer is just, you know, you're already doing these DirectX calls and DirectX things anyways, you're already presenting via the compositing engine in Windows. Why not give it other inputs before that even happens and then let the driver do it itself? And I I think it's a great idea. I'm at the moment, I'm only curious about two things. One is whether or not um, people who have something like an old GTX 1060, whether or not they can run XCSS, is a question. I mean, I don't know if they want to, but could they under this new scheme? I have no idea. We'll have to see it's how it's presented and how like users get access to which version of does, super uh, resolution they want to use. Does Pascal support DP4A? Maybe it doesn't. So they would use the crappy version of XCSS anyways. So let's just say a... I, I get the idea uh, of what you're arc- saying, which is that the, the yeah. automatic choice in theory for an older GPU would be um, FSR2, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah. But so, you know, yeah. you, we're seeing stuff that's happening now with the DP4A path on XCSS, where it's qualitatively better than FSR2, and you may prefer that instead. Yes, precisely. I just want to see how much user choice there is in which version of super resolution they have, uh, regardless of hardware. Um, and uh, another thing that I have that I'm a little curious about is: does it support frame generation as a toggle? Right. Is that a different thing altogether? Mm. Uh, Microsoft can be a little bit behind the times <laughs> uh, regarding like how things are quickly advancing. I do think DirectX has slowed down in its development uh, in comparison. I just thought about the other day, like the jump from DX7 to DX9 is just like a couple years and they're like so radically different. Uh, and then you had like DX11 for a decade. So, yeah, um, I, I just I just want to see if there's frame generation support. I also want to see if they iterate it over time to have more inputs than just uh, color and motion vectors, uh, because things like ray reconstruction or other interesting things, like even more in depth versions of frame generation, could take in to account like what like material IDs and all these other things like I I feel like it shouldn't just be limited to like standard things like color and motion vectors it could it should allow the developer to input anything they want and depending upon what the driver is doing like the nvidia amd or intel driver then they could leverage it even more and a develop that means developers could get things like frame generation or ray reconstruction in their game without actually doing a lot as much work as a full integration so i I, i'm just hoping it is a little bit more forward looking than just wholly about codifying the scheme i also want it to be like thinking about the future uh, because it would it'd be a shame to see things like frame generation. So like we finally get super resolution in all these games, but then once again, uh, there's just like this really arbitrary developer led choice of whether or not a game has frame generation, this frame generation, that frame generation, etc. I, I don't want to have to be constantly making videos about saying like, oh, this doesn't have FSR three or oh, this doesn't have DLSS three, even though it has the competitor's choice. Um, so yeah, Avatar, please, Avatar was Microsoft. a bit weird, wasn't it? Because you had DLSS two spatial yeah. upscaling, but you didn't have DLSS three. 
uh, fame generation, but you did have AMD uh, FSR. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that was that was a that was a sad one because like oh, they they did so, like everything right except for like that. <laughs> 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 everything about that game is great. They just re- they released a patch. Uh, I want to. I'm not. Maybe I'll talk about it on the next DF Direct, but it releases the day of recording here. But I want to kind of talk about it just to uh, talk about nice things that patches can do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Any thoughts on this, John? I mean, uh, does how really... does this affect how does this affect me as a Radeon Seven fan? <laughs> you, you, you would be uh, getting FSR two all day long. All I right believe. then, yeah. There we go. Does it support FSR one though? Is the question. Mm, I bet it does. Actually, I bet it does. Hundred percent, it does. FSR one, baby. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, um, that's all. That's all we got for news this week. So we're going to plow on relentlessly into support of Q and A. But before I do that, I want to get a, a quote unquote shout out uh, to our new show that we've uh, put together for Patreon supporters called uh, DF Indirect. Uh, which is essentially, well, every week we have a huge array of amazing questions from supporters. We never get through all of them and some of them require research. So what we're doing in indirect is to put together a special show for supporters that just tackles more supporter questions, right? We've just recorded our first show this week. Uh, John was away, unfortunately, but uh, Oliver stepped in manfully and did a great job. (laughs) <laughs> and um, yeah, that will be going out very, very soon. And um, yeah, some of those topics uh, that we discuss may well end up on DF Clips. So if you're not sub- uh, subscribed to DF Clips, do it now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but yeah, I guess we just move on to support a Q&A for this show. And um, the first question is from um, let's have a quick look here. Uh, it's from Johnny underscore five A. And his question is, hey, DF crew, recently heard about AMD's new 5700X 3D CPU. Being an AM4 socket, is it a worthy upgrade to the 2700X I'm currently using? Or would the oh older gosh. RAM PCIe standards hold it back too much? If it helps, MOBO is X470 paired with 3060 Ti. Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, it is a worthy upgrade because the 2700X is actually, a, by today's standards, a really poor CPU. <laughs> and um, Alex, uh, the 2700X is uh, well, basically an overclocked version of the 1700X I gave you back in, I think, 2018, which you weren't <laughs> happy about. I did not like that CPU. But uh, but yeah, it, this would be a worthy upgrade. Very worthy. Um, especially with this, because uh, the thing is, you're pairing it with a GPU that I don't think is going to scale much beyond it, uh, that platform can offer. To be completely honest with you, it, it's a great enough GPU, um, but um, I think if you were to, you'd be paying a lot more for the next Ryzen platform, AM5. You'd arguably be paying more for RAM too, uh, and you can instead focus that uh, that money elsewhere, and you could just get a essentially a, what is this? This this is just a. So, presuming your does your motherboard support this? Yeah, um, it does. Yeah, yeah. They, they've basically not all, done not BIOS all updates for the vast majority yeah. of AM4 boards to support the uh, the latest chips. Um, yeah. So if they do in that case, I think there was a, some rare versions of them where they didn't have enough like ROM space. Yeah, <laughs> something so they had to drop support for, for Ryzen. For the most part, they seem to have what? overcome that limitation. Good, 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 good. So I, I think in this case, I think that is a great upgrade. I uh, I fully endorse this. This is great. yeah, fifty seven hundred X three D is essentially like the fifty eight hundred X three D with a slight down clock, same TDP. So that's not really a problem. Fifty. Uh, the one thing which does come up though is that the pricing is often very, very similar to the fifty eight hundred X three D, which is it, worth bearing in mind. Yeah, in that case, then. Yeah, the 5800 X3D, also, if it's so close. There's also a 5600 X3D, which again would be a revelatory upgrade over your 2700 X. Uh, at the same time, though, I'd get an eight core processor at least because I know current gen and whatnot, but there's a couple games that actually do see a benefit from six to eight. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is nice uh, to have. 
it's not a good example, but something like probably like The Last of Us Part One, for example, like have yeah. have slightly less stutters when you transition scenes. There. <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, the twenty seven hundred X is basically uh, the the first generation Ryzen technology there with a with an overclock essentially, and um, yeah, back in the day. Well, sort of Ryzen battle stories here. Ryzen came along, everyone was expecting it to be awesome. The benchmarks were awesome simply by virtue of how many cores it had. And, you know, you looked at Cinebench and it looked like single core performance was fine. But then you play some games and it was like, you know, um, I tagged it even with fast RAM as being equivalent to like a Intel Core i7 3770K without overclocking which which ain't great so you've got a bit more speed over that but that's really old levels of performance x3d is just awesome i think you know it is the greatest thing that i think um amd has done for a long long time because there's so many old boards dating back to 2017 you can just update the bios on them slot in a brand new uh, cpu and you're getting really good really good performance and um yeah so do that upgrade I think easily 2x if not more better frame times way better frame Absolutely. times the old old ryzen with the cross ccx latency or whatever and it was something that i got slammed for in the comments of all my youtube videos where i'd be like but but i keep getting stutters or something i definitely distinctly remember writing that saying that phrase in a number of videos and then getting slammed and because i would see i would always see the i5 8400 having yeah, better frame absolutely. times in that thing and it's like it was true my of course, John's sitting pretty there with his 12900K. It's <laughs> among men with power over millions of games. It's two years old now, but it's still hanging in there. Yeah, absolutely. It's still a great, great, great CPU. That's a good CPU. Um, well, let's move on to the next question. And this one is from uh, Yona, Jonas, Jonas Tagizadi, in brackets, Tagon86. I do like these guys who have uh, <laughs> their sort of hacker aliases in brackets. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's the best. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Anyway, uh, the question is is this. What kind of performance do you expect from the PS5 Pro? 2x FPS in GPU limited scenarios? Can we expect a classic uh, rich in theory video on this like he did for PS4 Pro? Uh, Now, when everybody seems to align regarding the specs, um, I guess I could do a video on that, right? I mean, we we, we kind of know that it's got 60 CUs um, out of 64 uh, on the die. Um, what we don't know is the secret source. Um, there was that, you know, the whole checkerboarding hardware that went into 4 Pro. And, um, but, you know, thinking back to that in theory video I did, I don't think it was too far off the mark, which was to say that certain games you could run at like, you know, 1620p, even higher, but a lot of games just ran best at 1440p, which is exactly where the PS4 Pro <laughs> landed for the most part. All those sort of um, games that didn't have a huge amount of investment into their pro versions. And I suspect it right. might be the same here because um, 2x FPS in a GPU limited scenario, uh, you haven't got 2x the CUs this time. You might get a, a boost to the to the clock speeds, but I think it way well be down to the secret source and whether this uh, upscaling solution that Sony is allegedly doing actually pans out. But that was something we actually, Alex, we talked about in um, uh, DF Indirect, which is the patent that's been going mm-hmm. around regarding Sony's um, uh, upscaling, pay- yeah, upscaling technologies or experiments, which you know didn't seem to amount to much. <laughs> in in yeah. all honesty, <laughs> yeah, I think two X performance in a GPU limited scenario. The reason why I don't like saying that always is because, like you said, not every aspect of the chip is going to be 2x better. No, likely, memory right? bandwidth certainly won't be. Yeah, that's the one thing that I immediately thought of. Like, not every case is so... A lot of things is like... There's always this, like... There's also with the fact that, like, you're sharing this with the CPU, too, and the CPU is such a limiting factor here. It's really hard to get a grasp, I think, at what exactly it'll mean for games. You could do it in theory video, for sure, based upon the hardware you have access to right now mm-hmm. on the AMD side of things, assuming it's already in A3 and Yeah, whatever. big assumptions there. Yeah, but, you know, like, I feel like if you just 
in vacuum drop that in a really high C powered CPU system, it could maybe even rep misrepresent to a slight degree what is possible, especially since like if the, 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 the amount of VRAM stays the same too. Just doubling performance is not always in a, in a purely GP limited scenario. It's not always so wholly interesting as adding in transformative experiences like path tracing or yeah. real RT, et cetera. So, and I always feel like this is a hard one. I think waiting a little bit longer till we get more info could be really beneficial yeah. to a potential the, the, the crucial thing here think. is like the clock speed of the GPU mm -hmm. in terms of this uh, theoretical 2X um, FPS. John, what would you actually want from a PS5 Pro? Because there's, you know, it's kind of thin pickings, really. There's no display upgrade that, that really warrants it. But at the same time, we are seeing some distressingly low resolutions on uh, current generation games targeting 60 FPS. Well, that's just it, isn't it? The the resolution numbers, especially as Unreal Engine 5 starts to become used more frequently, they're worryingly low. And it does have an impact on image quality, even at a reasonable distance. And I think that I'm hoping at least that something like the PS5 Pro can kind of come along and hopefully clean that stuff up, maybe smooth out some of the rough edges in performance, uh, given that developers will still be targeting the older machines that should lead to a smoother, better experience all around for PS5 Pro, rather than any sort of like meaningful, gigantic visual difference. It's basically just like swapping a new GPU in your PC, which right. I think at this point, we're kind of okay enough with that model. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be it would be a digital foundry console. I can't see it being a massive appealing factor yeah, to, yeah, the, yeah. to the mainstream. It's not going to change the fortunes of the PlayStation 5 life cycle in any meaningful way. Um, because it is just an, an iter you know, it, obviously the games will look better, but it is an iterative upgrade, more so, I think, than the PS4 Pro was, because there was a legitimate target display yeah. that was meaningfully better than what was already out there. But, like, in terms of... So the interesting thing is, in terms of, like, if I were advising someone to make a PC build, and they had, like, a... Uh, like Let's say a, a Radeon RX 6700... And they wanted to get like a 7800 XT, I would advise them against it. I would say wait a little bit longer or get a different brand of GPU at that point. You know what I mean? Like to get like a revelato revelatory difference for the amount of money you're expanding, mm. like there. I don't know. That's just me. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next yeah. question, I think. Uh, this one from Alexander Seidel. When games will be fully path traced, what options do you expect we'll see in the graphics menu, aside from the obvious post-processing stuff like DLSS, texture quality and ray options that are given, but what else would we need that even has any performance impact large enough that it would necessitate the option to turn it down slash off? I was a bit surprised by how many rasterization settings there still were in the Alan Wake 2 path tracing mode. I guess you spent a lot of time with Alan Wake. Can you explain that, Alex? Well, there's still a lot of rasterization uh, settings modes in um, Cyberpunk RT Overdrive, right? Yeah, of course, because not everything's uh, going to be path traced. Things like volumetrics are not going to be path traced. Um, whether or not something is visible uh, and what LOD it uses, these things are not... Path tracing in games currently isn't doing uh, primary visibility for most things. Right. It's slightly there. Um for some things but not f like the the generic ge geometry you see usually so there are a lot of settings uh regarding those things it's mainly about the lighting when they say path tracing that the lighting is being done that way so um in that case it makes a lot of sense to have those things but when let's just presume in the future that just like uh portal rtx or wake 2 rtx that even like primary visibility is being traced which is Maybe an eventual, his, you know, historical outcome. We'll see how long it takes for that to happen if it does, because there's still some benefits to rasterizing the like certain aspects of the game. Um, and uh, when that happens, I think I would love to see like the the ray count for certain things, uh, kind of like we saw in Quake Two RTX. I would also maybe love to see like the update rate for aspects of the BVH, so you could control the gpu and cpu costs of that much better so uh, in a game like spider-man for example i really like that they allow you to control 
the distance at which uh, geometry is actually in there to be traced against for certain things. But I would also love to see like distant objects update at like five frames out of every 60. Maybe you want to turn that up to 60 out of 60 or turn it down or have them be static, etc. These are all options that I think would uh, make the path tracing future much more scalable so it, it do, so it doesn't just run on RTX 4090s, 4070s, et cetera, but it, the future GPUs could then, that are lower end, could also get path tracing experiences with uh, lower end CPUs as well, too. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on this one, John? Uh, I mean, I think Alex kind of nailed it there, but yeah, it's just um, turning down things within like the BVH <laughs> yes. structure makes the most sense, right? Like just if you can reduce the number of rays you need to send out and the density of those rays, you're going to get some performance gain. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately mm-hmm. to get really like the, the ultimate path trace, you just have to send off so many freaking rays and we're still focusing on, I think that's where we're going to continue to see upgrades beefier hardware you can send out more rays get more accuracy without needing to rely on on other technologies to sort of make up for it uh i i wonder if we could ever get to a point i mean denoising it seems kind of necessary unless you got to just this point where you're overlapping like overdrawing so many rays but at that point the right. expense of that would be so high that it doesn't seem feasible so I mean, I yeah. guess it just it, it feels like the focus of where you'll need to turn down the settings could potentially change depending on what they're doing. But there's still a lot of rasterized stuff happening in these games anyway. So, mm-hmm. okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. This one from Carrot Source. Uh, Hello, DF exclamation point. Still waiting for the announcement of the 4090 egregious. Yeah, we all are. Uh, anyway, given the sad state of gaming and layoffs, do you think this will impact QA and will games be less optimized than they already are at launch? Will oh, this no. quote unquote new norm in business also be developers would rely on Unreal Engine more as it's probably more cost effective? I sure hope not because I have a deep love for non UE games. Thoughts? John, what do you think about this? I mean, there's going to be an impact one way or another because if you remove human resources from any given project, that you know those resources are gone, right? QA is yeah. QA is one of these ones that's you know it's it's almost certainly to the end user um, almost invisible and yet of crucial importance. Yeah, that stuff is extremely important to that, and I do think uh, Unreal obviously they're they're trying to do they're they're putting a lot of effort into reducing the amount of manpower required to do certain things, right? Mm. Which is useful. Uh, but we were just talking about. Uh, the nature of subject, the lack of subjective analysis or tech QA, we don't want to reduce QA further because that's just, that is just going to lead to worse experiences, I think. Yeah. And you're right. It's like it, those, those types of people are uh, less visible to the public, one could say, but it's so darn important to what you play. And I, I feel like the general public reacts very, very, very harshly towards bugs these days in a yeah. way that seems I would almost describe as mean spirited to a point right. where like it's becoming even harder and it can just result in gigantic back backlash on social media. So I get I get the, your point, but when a game costs seventy dollars, you know, there I, has to be a certain <laughs> level of quality and polish. Yeah, well the the problem is, though, is that a lot of the bugs that people race to find are ultimately not that important to the main well, game. Well, it's, it's it's selective outrage, right, where they're actually manufacturing a scenario to make a game look bad. Correct. That's, that's what they're doing. It's as extremely opposed, dishonest and very yeah, common. As opposed to a, a genuine issue a game may have that shouldn't have got through to the end user. Skull and Bones example. Uh, in my video, I said, like, yeah, there's some, like, visual <laughs> stuff. It doesn't really matter, though. But like if like the main quest you're doing just doesn't, doesn't trigger, work. Yeah. that's bad. Doesn't work. It's like the one that you you where you're supposed to get off your boat the first time. That's not good. It kind of feels. And I don't. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, damn it. That that's just like the situation I would highly like to avoid in the future. Uh, QA should not be skimped on uh, at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more to add to that one? It seems like a pretty vast topic. But um, yeah, I guess that's what's going to happen in the next few years, right? Which, you know, if we are looking at a constriction in the uh, resources available to any given game in the industry, there's got to be a a cost for that. And um, the challenge is going to be making that cost less visible to the end user, I think. Um, Or, as we discussed earlier, just changing the focus of what a game actually is. Um, But yes, 
Let's move on to the next uh, question. This one from Shane Cooland. Shane Coolan, I think. Xbox has recently said that the next generation will be the quote unquote largest technical leap we've seen in a generation. What does that mean to you? Um, AI, cloud, raw power in the box. Could Xbox move up market and offer a premium experience to the baseline PS6? Current gen Xbox provides an almost identical gaming experience to the PS5 with less games. I'm hoping a next gen Xbox can actually provide justification for its spot in my entertainment unit. <laughs> and being able to provide a 60 slash 120 FPS experience at the same settings as a PS6 30 60 experience for third party games uh, would do that. I'd rather see them stop trying to compete with PlayStation and start being an alternative to a $1,000 gaming PC. Is it a pipe dream? Is it a pipe dream, John? Sounds like one. Yeah, it sounds like a pipe dream. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, largest technical leap comes from the same, pla same place as the greatest lineup in Xbox history, <laughs> which, you know, it's that it has that kind of energy going on it. Well, it's yeah, just... it's one of the quantifiable metrics in making that statement, which you never uh, hear. Exactly. And fundamentally, though, the issue we're facing now is that the technology itself is largely not the limiting factor with how games look and run these days. It's the manpower behind it so yes yeah, given point. given given everything we were just talking about with regards to game scale and the difficulties for production it's kind of weird at this point to think about like the largest technical leap uh as like a key thing that needs to be solved right now so i mean obviously more power can always be useful but what how something is perceived as a technical leap largely falls on the shoulders of the people making the content so even if you do have the most powerful box in the world, uh, how that's perceived, you know, if people, it, it's the games, it's the software yeah. that allows people to make that co that case. <laughs> well, uh, Shane here is positing the idea that the next Xbox would be twice as powerful as the next PlayStation, which I think is uh, optimistic. optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, simply I, because, you know, they've got a budget for these boxes that they have to um, adhere to. And then they have a silicon budget, a memory budget, and it kind of all convenes in a kind of, um, uh, what can you say, an amalgamation of very similar looking parts. Mm. Yeah. Um, thoughts, Alex? What is the largest technical leap uh, that we'll see in the next generation? Uh, well, I mean, I guess Microsoft's already talked about it with those leaks uh, from the FTC about just using some sort of machine learning. Uh, I think that'd be interesting. Uh, they, But, you know, with whatever the PS5 Pro does, maybe it comes first, and it's not such an interesting leap anymore. <laughs> um, in which case, I do like the idea that the question is talking about, and we've talked about it before here, where there's like a low-end Xbox that's pretty cheap. Like the Series S is now, but the baseline is so much higher by that point. Or, or uh, it's a handheld. And, or it's a handheld, which is the my, which I would prefer. I and the then, then there's a dedicated, yeah. yeah the, and then there's a dedicated home machine, which is actually though more expensive than your typical console, but it's premium. Uh, and I don't know what that means. Maybe that's how they unlock this largest technical leap thing by it being a actually just a more expensive machine so it can do things that a cheaper box couldn't afford to do yeah maybe it's just we're never going to get that kind of leap again like i still think the leap from playstation to playstation 2 is the one that blew me away the most i mean you're talking not only did the visuals improve so dramatically and they really did but we saw like 4x resolution boost and largely double the frame rate all while getting a, a huge increase to visual quality and effects work. And it's like, that's just the nature of where technology was at that time. And now that manpower has become the biggest limiting factor, I just feel like we're not going to be able to see anything like that ever again. It's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we did see from the FTC leak was essentially alignment with what NVIDIA is doing now, which is ray tracing, which is frame generation, which is super resolution. All of those things combined, you could arguably say, will deliver um, a, a large technical leap, whether it's the largest. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. So it could be the largest in terms of Xbox history, right? Because they basically right. en entered huh. the market at the PlayStation 2 level, one might say. 
uh, certainly in the you know they were contemporaries, yeah. right? That, I think that's the only way to do it. Man, the Xbox to Xbox 360 leap was pretty big, but that was a big leap too. I mean, resolution, complexity of shading, yeah, way higher. 360 was so higher. good. What a good 360 is a great machine. <sighs> I don't think we've got too much more to say about that, but you know. I can see that, you know, stuff like 60 and 120 would be eminently more viable because stuff like frame generation and super resolution will be absolutely very mature technologies by the time these uh, these new machines come along. So the kinks would have been ironed out, right? Perceptually, you will be seeing things that you wouldn't have, you know, really expect to be seeing on a Series X, I'd say. Um, Actually, Rich, interesting you mentioned frame generation because Mark Triforce Dudison back here saw frame generation for the first time on my PC. And given that their channel is focused on like extreme scrutiny of retro pixels to the point where YUV compression is an issue, uh, he was very impressed. Cool. How impressed were you, Mark? I was pretty impressed. It did it look like <laughs> did it look like frames were actually being generated like in a non conventional manner? Did it seem like native? I, I would never have known that it was turned on if you didn't tell. Okay. There you go. That's did cool. you play it, though? Did you play it? You you, you did control it. A you, little bit. Yeah, and it felt responsive, right? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. this is a, he just came in straight. He didn't... Yeah, there we go. Okay. Straight, straight no from BS. the gallery. First con- like I just said, that first contact. I said this uh, um, on a podcast not too long ago, but like, yeah... Uh, that first contact, I think, with frame gen for most people, especially if they're using DLSS three, should be pretty positive experience. Yep, yep. Assume, assuming like, the base frame rate is high enough, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. You got it. Yeah, like that. That's that's a given. But yeah, should be positive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, is it a pipe dream? Um, perceptually, maybe not, but in real terms, probably is. Yeah, yeah I think that's the okay. that's the the answer to that one. Um, let's move on to our final question of the show. This one from. <laughs> how, do I, how do I do this? Crash Sune Animations. Do, would you concur yeah, with that sure. pronunciation? I approve. I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, hey, DF Crew! Exclamation point! Back in 2014, I vividly remember uh, how upgrading from the PS3 version of Borderlands 2 to the PC version was mind blowing, mostly because of its highly <laughs> impressive implementation of Nvidia's PhysX technology. The interactive fluid simulation for elemental types, as well as uh, cloth physics on props, which you could shoot into different sections, were truly ambitious and, dare I say it, cromulent. Ex- exclamation point. <laughs> Why don't we see features and technology like this today in an era where you can quote unquote drag and drop similar features in popular engines such as UE5 and Alex? Are we still going to see a video covering the legacy of PhysX? Exclamation point. Question mark. Thanks, crew. Exclamation point. Um, Alex, oh, yeah. so there, there's been movement on the physics front. there's been movement there's, there's been events <laughs> happening yes so, so the background i tested the a geophysics card that i have it's not working so oh. I, I i ordered up two more so <laughs> two, more. Uh, well, two more well i originally ordered one but the person also had another one interestingly enough so they're sending me that too for the same price which is great okay. Uh, so I'll have two, and I'll, let's hope so that one of them works. You both... one, but you're, you've, you've got a buy one, get one free scenario. I got a buy one, get one free scenario, okay. which was awesome. Uh, and I'm going to plug those in. Those should be the normal PCI ones. I had a PCIe 1.1X one, 1, which is more annoying because that's uh, arguably less, it's less portable. But either way, so that video is definitely going to... That video is definitely going to come. I'm going to get it working, and then I'm going to test out a lot of games, figure out the best way I want to like demo it, and all these things, and then also figure out a way to like compare it to like GPU acceleration of physics, which is another part of the video eventually. Um, but the whole physics thing and why games don't do cool physics stuff anymore, largely, uh, well, one, there's no Nvidia back push for this anymore to a large degree where back then it was a great differentiating factor for nvidia gpus cuda running physx on your gpu and um uh nvidia wanting to differentiate they sponsored games to add this in i'm sure developers also wanted it in too for the marketing purposes and also because it made the game look really cool um but uh since that isn't a thing anymore there's just less sponsorship of it there's not a great incentive to do it the other incentive is like the gameplay aspect and oliver talked about this before where 
and we've talked about it before on the channel where like in the PS360 era and like right until the Xbox One PS4 era began, there was actually a larger systems driven design that was happening that uh, went by the wayside for the large point and was narrative driven, single player, more controlled experiences uh, kind of became more favorable. You have the difference of like, look at the difference between Crisis and Call of Duty. They came out in the same year. They present uh, single player campaigns that people really like, but they have radically different design on the modern, like the, the first person shooter formula. One's very physics and simulation driven and the other one isn't. And you, you see less of that crisis -y kind of style of approach to like physical sandbox that you can play in to some other one. And over time, that disappears so much so uh, that it's just not a, a big feature of games. And so when I think when you see games having, a great example is actually what happened at the beginning of the, the Xbox One X, uh, sorry, Xbox One generation, where instead of having like physics being there, you saw like a change where like there would be a physics event that would occur and they would use like Alembic yep. animations and which are not real real-time physics they're a played back like, yeah. vertex cache animation so uh and it just goes to show that it was more about bringing spectacle about that wasn't player driven usually to one that was just like um like beforehand is where like you just touch something in the world and it reacts in a slightly silly but somewhat realistic way and it's a lot of fun and uh, you know i like i definitely like that approach i definitely like that weird physics approach i found it always so fascinating to like i don't know blow up a box and have all like the paper fly out or any of the cool stuff that physics did I, i'm a big fan of it uh, a lot of people disliked it they called it you know like a frame rate killer but the reasons for it being a frame rate killer in the retrospect are actually interesting and i hopefully i can go into that in the physics video when i do talk about it because gpos now they're more equipped than it than they ever were before for doing that kind of stuff without it killing the frame rate um yeah we don't see mm -hmm. it anything to add to that sean i mean i'm just thankful we have games like teardown and control i'd even say yeah uh, still right. happening these days that push physics and i do think it can be an interesting gameplay feature but it can also be a difficult one to tame for the design so I think it's both hardware and design related that we don't see it as often as we might like because it does take a certain yeah. level of, of care to implement that into your game in a way that's actually meaningful and interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Control obviously launched with a lot of issues on the uh, last generation consoles oh, yeah. simply due to the fact that, which brings me on to another topic actually as to why the sort of shift away from physics is come down to hardware balance really in the consoles where well xbox 360 playstation 3 comparatively had a, a much stronger focus on cpu therefore you saw a lot of cpu driven systems right and uh, you know you go back to games like crackdown or whatnot you know i spent hours in crackdown just testing the physics just you know doing crazy stuff with mm -hmm. gigantic explosions to see what would happen you know that's that's not fracture yeah, so many yeah, great, great sort of fashion stuff. gorilla. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my god, that game's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, obviously we moved to Jaguar in 2013 with the um, with the eighth generation of consoles, and that sort of you know where we did see games like Just Cause Three, it all went horribly wrong in terms of performance um, because oh, you know gosh. it simply wasn't really designed for that that kind of experience. And I'd argue, you know, we were hoping, I think that the CPU, the Zen 2 CPU and the consoles has turned into a bit of a anti-climax, I would say. Obviously, it's a lot better than, than Jaguar, but it isn't really enabling these kind of physics-driven systems. A lot of it seems to be do, being done on the, on the GPU, right? Certainly in tear, Teardown, I'd imagine. Yes, Teardown, I'm pretty sure it actually all has to... What, majority be done on the, mm, the GPU think. for it to work at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's an interesting but I will one. be looking forward to your content on this, Alex, because um, it's one of these kind of um, evolutionary paths, branches that kind of withered uh, in, the, yeah. in gaming. And looking back at some of the stuff that we saw, you know, Mirror's Edge is a 
classic example, right? Yeah, the best. <laughs> yeah, Mirror's Edge looks awesome. I'm going to dig out so many games that people forgot. I'm going to dig out... I actually dug out Dark Void secretly for a video last year. Right. Uh, and I, I, it's it's featured in a video oh. last year. Can anyone guess which video it is? No, because it's a secret, apparently. It's a secret, it's a yeah. Secret. But it's actually in the Avatar video. Oh, okay. The, the, the music in the video oh. is all from Dark Void. That's why it's so good, because it's Bear McCreary. Man. Did. Uh, God of you know, War. So nothing Galactica to do with physics and God of such. War. No, it doesn't have to do with the <laughs> physics, but uh, but I just I had to dark void. Uh, I'm gonna bring out back cryostasis. Uh, cryostasis. I'm gonna bring back. Oh, I'm gonna bring back everything, baby. I tried to We're install dark void on Graw. the Steam Deck. I'm bring back Graw. and it spectacularly exploded. It did not work. Oh, it did. <laughs> Steam Deck did not, not like that game at all. Thankfully, it did not <laughs> literally explode, but. <laughs> The only thing is, I need to track down a copy of Cryostasis. Oh, I got oh, it with. I have a physical box years copy ago. here. In okay, the case. then I may need to ask you for it. Send me the ISO I'll send or you something. The ISO. Because, <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't have my copies. I had digital copies of that game, two of them, and I've lost them since. Oh. NVIDIA gave them to me, by the way. NVIDIA gave them to me. Okay. So I maybe should call up NVIDIA Jensen, tell him to give me my Cryostasis. <laughs> Cryostasis back. was cool. Man. That, was, that was a cool game. It is a cool Just game. Just love the conceit Sleep that you've reason. got uh, Jensen on speed dial. <laughs> yes, he's right here. <laughs> uh, fingertip away. Uh, fingertip dear. away. Okay, I think that's it. That's the end of the show. So please do uh, like, subscribe, share on the off chance that you did enjoy it. Ring the bell for notionally instant notifications. And yes, um, do consider supporting us on the DF Supporter Program. DF Indirect number one should be available soon, if not now. Who knows? And at store.digitalfoundry.net for access to our merchandising wares. I'm not sure if this... uh, Digital Foundry approved Seal of Quality shirt is available yet, but it's coming soon. And Ooh, um, that's a fancy shirt. It's a it's that a great shirt that's hopefully not going to land us in court. It's uh, very fitting for today's <laughs> discussion, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, that was part of the decision making process because there is another shirt that I should be wearing next week. Um, but that's oh. all from us. For, is it? Yeah, you should is be it? getting them soon too. Well, I was going to say, is oh, that great. is that really all from us? Because if you look of behind, course, me, we st- need oh. we need to go back. And uh, examine the activities in your background, Progress. John. Right. So, quick check in here, Mark. Where are you in Star Fox sixty four? I just beat Andros's true form on the hard path. He just beat Andros's true form on the hard path, right okay. as the podcast is ending. Again, there it is. How does he do he it? He beat it on easy. <laughs> now he did the hard path. He's doing the escape looking thing back there. Okay. Uh, yeah, the warthog run essentially. You effectively beat game. the game again while we recorded. So, congratulations, Mark. We'll be using that footage in a video sometime soon. Some D- <laughs> make big sure, DF retro thing happening. Uh, just make sure. I, I don't know if the how the path in that game works that way. Does that make you to the sub level if you do the quick path? I don't remember. I actually don't recall, but that is the fun, funniest level in that game. Should, sure. should I tease sure. what the DF Retro is, Rich? Well, you, you have been teasing for the last two yeah, weeks, to be fair. That's true. That is true. Yeah, just go ahead. Maybe just leave it. So we're going to uh, hopefully sometime soon work on a video that covers the year one of Nintendo 64. Okay. Which is looking at the entire first year of games and sort of putting into perspective what the N64, like what it was like to live through the era of N64 in that first year. And I think there's an interesting story there. And it's a, it's a very, it was a difficult time for Nintendo fans in many ways, but there was still some very cool things happening in that space. We're going to kind of go through it. And Star Fox just barely makes the cut, barely makes the cut. So here we are. 11 hours, sorry, 11 months. (laughs) Right, the, something, something like that. I, I need to hit, it's like the same month. Uh, I, th- I think it's like one, basically one year after the Japanese launch, effectively right around that time. So okay. yeah, of course, I still have that Japanese N sixty four I got from you, Rich. Well, interesting you story about the Japanese N sixty four, which is that um, that was actually a launch model, and um, well, I was working at the time. We held a raffle to see who would get one of three. Nintendo 64s that were being imported from uh, from Japan, and uh, I won that raffle. That's awesome. So I spent, you know, I had a great deal of time off. I was pre- pre- between projects at the time, and I basically had like a month playing 
Super Mario 64, which was effectively the only thing worth having at that point. Uh, although and then maybe you put it into storage. Um, well, you know, obviously <laughs> that was that was decades ago. <laughs> but yes, I did put it into storage. And you were, uh, you were a Saturn man, so. Yeah, but that was um, yeah, that was kind of at the midpoint. Yeah, so yeah, I guess so. Yeah, what it was, it was in my uh, uh, as, as the supporter said earlier, it was in my entertainment center alongside the Saturn <laughs> and the PlayStation, for that matter. But yeah, uh, I would be very interested to see what's happening with that coverage. Uh, that, that'll be a fun one. An how many games one. were there in year one? Oh, I don't have the exact number handy, but it's it's. If I recall, it's actually less than what PlayStation had for each of its launches in total. Okay, well that makes kind of sense, right? So it, it's a fairly right. low number, which is part of the story mm-hmm. around N sixty four. I mean, the fun part for me about the N sixty four was just just the the obviously there was the delay and the pre hype where you know everybody was just bringing up silicon graphic workstation. Oh outputs. yeah, yeah. Like, here's the T-1000. Expect this from your next Nintendo console. <laughs> the Jurassic Park dinosaur. Yeah. It's going to be right in your game, baby. <laughs> mm. Oh, dear. Okay, well, right. that sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I guess Mark will be on his way, though, shortly, right? He's not going to yeah, be yeah, featuring yeah. Next, in the background anytime next soon. Next week, yep, heading back. Okay. So this was the last, uh, the last hurrah here as he rolls credits on Star Fox. <laughs> Again, nice. Again. <laughs> okay, well, that's it. That is indeed the end of the show this time. And uh, I guess we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.